seated. Open your Bibles this morning to the book of Exodus, chapter 1. Last time I preached, a couple of weeks ago, I preached out of verses 1 through 7. We're going to be ministering out of verses 15 through 17. Once again, in this series that I felt the Lord direct me on the book of Exodus, and I, 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 my intentions are to go through the entire book of Exodus, not every verse, of course, but there is so much wealth. The book of Exodus, in my opinion, it opens up to us in the Old Testament. We begin to see in a crystal clear way the plan of God for the redemption of humanity. It's like the gospel comes alive. In Genesis, we saw the sacrifice instituted by Abel, and it was a sacrifice for a person. But in Exodus, we'll see the sacrifice for a house. And we see the plan of God as regards the cross because in the offering up of that lamb, the Lord spoke to the people and, and said to apply the blood to the doorpost. And when they applied it, they were given specific commands, once in the middle at the top and once on either side, forming a cross. Someone asked me, well, one time, why didn't they apply blood on the floor as well? And I said, no, you don't walk on the blood. You walk through the blood. But in that imagery and typology, we see in Exodus the plan of God in a beautiful, beautiful way. And don't let anybody ever tell you that the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, is not relevant for today. If anybody tells you that, get away from them as fast as you can because they don't know what they're talking about. You cannot understand the New Covenant without a proper understanding of the Old Covenant. Because if we've, you've heard us, all of us say many times, the old covenant is the new covenant hidden. And the new covenant is the old covenant revealed to man. And in my studies for this, I'm using three primary sources. Uh, first of all, the Exodus commentary, the ministry commentary. If you don't have it, you can pick it up at the bookstore. Those of you that are watching, you need to get it. You can go to online to shopjsm.org. You need to get the Exodus commentary. And then secondly, I am using George Williams' commentary on the Bible. And thirdly, a book entitled uh, Gleanings in Exodus by Arthur Pink. George Williams was an Irish scholar, has been dead many years. Arthur Pink was an English scholar. And, you know, uh, a while back, you know, both of these men, George Williams and Arthur Pink, they, they were not Pentecostal. They were Baptist, Reformed. And sometimes, you know, I know Dad gets the emails. I get a lot of emails. Why are you using these people? They're not Pentecostal. Well, why not? God gave them an understanding of things, especially Brother Williams, Brother Peake, of the Old Testament. And it's poor scholarship not to avail yourself of every resource material. And we must understand that these men operated in the light that they had. But what a light they had. Because the things they bring out, both Brother Williams and Brother Pink, are just tremendous. Verse 15, chapter 1, Exodus, And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Shiprah, and the name of the other Pua. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. What we're seeing here is a satanic plan birthed in hell to stop the coming of the Redeemer. Everything is about Jesus Christ. Every attack of Satan, 
while we may be the recipients, it really is an attack against the Word of God and the deity and the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And I want to deal with that opposition. I want to deal with the subject of persecution this morning because that's what Israel, the children of Israel, were experiencing at this time in the land of Egypt. Persecution. Would you bow your heads? Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the spirit of the Lord that we have sensed in this house. Your presence is everything. As the scripture said, if your presence doesn't go with us, we cannot go. Nothing can be done without your presence. I ask you to anoint me to minister and anoint these, your people, to hear, to receive, and to understand. And we give you all the praise and glory. And everybody said, amen and amen. I have heard so many messages preached out of the book of Exodus, and it, it, it's amazing how many preachers use the book of Exodus uh, to present the salvation message. And you can do that. The spirit of Exodus lends itself to that. But it's really not a book of salvation as far as the sinner is concerned. But it's really a book dealing with the sanctification of the saint. It's dealing with deliverance. It's dealing with the fact that Egypt in Bible typology is a type of the system of this world that we live in. Pharaoh that was set up on the throne is a type of Satan himself. The taskmasters that we'll bring out in a moment, they are type of demon spirits that war against the children of God. And I know some would blanch and say, yes, it's about salvation. No, it's really not because remember, when God sent Aaron and Moses to stand before Pharaoh, he said, let my people go. And the idea is this, that in this world system, in this Egypt that we're living in, Satan doesn't care that you're saved. He'll do everything in his power to heap burden upon burden and bondage upon bondage to where there is no joy in your Christian living. But we're going to find out this morning that there is an answer to every single problem that plagues the human condition. And so we, we see all of this. And the Bible said there was a new king that now sat upon the throne of Egypt. And the scripture plainly says, who knew not Joseph and the Holy Spirit. There is a specific reason why he says this. Because it was under Joseph, you know the story, the seven years of plenty, the seven years of famine, how God raised up Joseph, gave him favor in the eyes of Pharaoh, and through his leadership as the Holy Spirit led him, this famine that the Lord brought about, that he was able through Joseph's leadership as he brought him out of prison to interpret his dream to save the nation. And as Joseph brought in Jacob and his brothers and all of their, their livestock and their husbands, their, I mean, their wives and their children and all their servants and all their slaves. In all of this, God would begin to birth a, a new nation. Now, there's something about this that I want you to understand. Persecution at times is allowed by God. Boy, that was quiet. Persecution at times is allowed by God. At times, God allows bad things to happen to bring about a good end. What do you mean by that? Well, God allowed this famine to take place. He allowed it for the specific reason to bring the children of to Jacob and his sons into Egypt to preserve them. He knew this famine was coming. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. Listen, he knows what's going to happen with the economy. He knows what's going to happen with the upcoming election. He knows what's going to happen in Washington. He knows what the future, and he's got a plan. I want you to understand that this morning. In spite of all of the craziness that's going on in the world, God has a plan. He has a plan for this nation. He has a plan for the church. He has a plan for you, the child of God. You are a friend of God. 
Now understand that, and as a friend of God, meaning a child of God, he has a specific plan for your life. You are important in the kingdom of God. You're important to the plan of God. Boy, it's quiet in here. We often think that God, that he only, the plan of God only revolves around great men and women that he raises up and anoints them to do great and mighty things. And that's true. That's important. But the reality is they're few. Therefore, the bulk of what God does is carried forth on the backs of everyday normal children of God. That because of their faithfulness, because of their dedication, the gospel is able to go forth. You know, God has raised up this ministry to reach the world. Sunlight Broadcasting Network is a divine instrument of God raised up and given the mandate to take this gospel to the four corners of the world. And he is, he's calling and raising up others to touch this area, that area. But he's given this church, this television network, this ministry, a divine call to go forth and to reach the nations of the world. But we can't do it without you. Oh, that's weak. You are somebody special in the eyes of God. You have been allowed to be born when you were born to live at this time in this generation to be divinely used by God to help touch the four corners of the world. Somebody needs to shout on that. Just before service in the lobby, one of our dear folks whose who's, uh, daughter and son-in-law, they, they serve the Lord in Kenya, and they've been distributing the Expositor Study Bible, and she showed me a video. They just got back from a missions trip where they, uh, they drove nine hours from whatever area, part of Kenya they were in to another area of Africa, all to have a pastor's conference to put Expositor Study Bibles in their hands, and she was showing me the video of all of them standing there with big smiles on their face, uh, holding up the expositor study Bible. Listen, that would not have been possible without men and women. The world may not know who you are. Your next door neighbor may not know who you are, but God knows who you are, and he has divinely, somebody needs to shout. He has given you the privilege of entering into the kingdom of God and to the work of God. You are responsible for souls being saved, lives being changed, believers being baptized in the Holy Spirit, sick bodies being, you have had a part in it because God has a plan for your life. The Lord didn't die on Calvary to save man for man to plop down on a pew on his backside once or twice a week and throw a couple dollars in the offering plate. Uh Uh-uh. God has redeemed you. He has saved you. He has lifted you out of a miry clay. He has set your feet on a rock to stay. He has washed you in his precious blood. He has filled you with the Holy Spirit, not just to suck God's air, but to be somebody in the kingdom of God. But I I can't preach. I can't teach. I can't sing. I know we were, we were, uh, this past week in Dallas, you know, we had, we visited with Sister Gwen George. Remember Brother George, Don George, and, and who went on to be with the Lord. And, and uh, Gwen was in the car with us, and we had gone to eat. And she said, she was talking to Gabriel and me. She said, oh, Don and Gabriel, I know y'all can sing. <laughs> I just smiled, and I said, <laughs> I said, well, Sister George, a broken clock is 
right twice a day. So every once in a while, I may, I may, I just may stumble on the right chord. <laughs> so we're not going to try that. Listen, there's many things that we can't do. But there's some things we can. Number one, we can pray. I said, number one, we can pray. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive their sin. Then will I heal their land. Number two, you can express faith. Give us men and women and teenagers in this church and a part of this television ministry that believes God. Lord, you have not called me to preach. You have not called me to teach. You have not called me to travel to the four corners of the world, but you have given me a unique opportunity to stand with Brother and Sister Swagger and Sun Life Broadcasting Network and reach this world. And Lord, wherever I'm going, I'm asking you, help them, anoint them. I believe God. Every power that comes against them, we take authority in the name of Jesus Christ. God, you have raised them up to touch this world. And Father, I'm expressing my faith right now to believe you that it will come to pass. Though you may be old and well stricken in you, there is still much land to possess. Hallelujah. God is still saying, go forward, go forward, go forward, go forward. We need your faith. We need your money. God has a plan. Just as he had a plan for the children of Israel, he has a plan for you. As Brother C.M. Ward said so long ago, he's gone on to be with the Lord, I don't know, 30 years ago maybe. But he said, the dollar, the gospel can only go as far as the dollar bill takes it. The message is free, but it costs something to get that message. See, if you got saved watching SBN, somebody had to pay for that airtime. If you got saved in a local church, somebody had to pay their tithe to keep the doors open. And don't give me this stinking no count, waste of time email. No tithing is no testament concept. We don't have to pay. You old stinking cheapskate. Get your hands out of your pocket and get your wallet saved. The bad Donnie just showed up. Got to push him back down. Give to help. Pray, faith, give. Ask God to make you an intercessory warrior. To believe God that the will of God will be carried out. So the Bible said that the, a new king. Now, it didn't mean just a new king in the form or the realm of a new dynasty. One Pharaoh following another Pharaoh in a hereditary line, but it literally meant a new king, actually an Assyrian. It was not an Egyptian. It was an Assyrian, and evidently the Assyrians had defeated the Egyptians. And now this new king sat on the throne. And the Bible said that he had no regard for the things of Joseph. He had no regard for the great exploits that Joseph had brought about to preserve the nation of Egypt. And the Bible said that he looked out among the kingdom and he saw 
these Hebrews multiplying and becoming mighty. And he said, if we don't do something, they're going to become more mighty than we. And the idea of that statement is he wasn't really speaking of the Hebrews becoming more mighty than the whole nation. As I said, it was an Assyrian. So it was Assyrians ruling the nation. But they were in the minority as it regards the Egyptians. And he said, when he looked out and he said, I've got the Egyptians over here that we have subjugated. And if these Hebrews, who are growing more mighty than we, if they ever join forces together, I don't know if we can beat them. They're more mighty and they're more powerful. And there's a great lesson there. In the eyes of the world, the Hebrew children were slaves. They were nothing. In the eyes of the world today, the world looks down upon us. They, don't, they could care less about us. But when Satan looks down and sees us, he sees a people that are mighty, that are powerful. Why? Because we have the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In my name, you'll lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. In my name, you'll cast out demons. In my name, if you drink any deadly thing without knowing it, it will not harm you. In my name, we have the authority of the name of Jesus Christ. I know the church is in trouble today, and I know sometimes it looks like we're just a puny bunch of people, but in the eyes of the evil one, he sees us, and he sees the one that stands behind us. He sees the one who goes before us. He sees the one who watches over us. It's a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb. And I know we're falling for a lot of fads today, but I got news for you. The church is about ready to rise. There's going to be a resurrection. The church has got to stand up and be the church, and we're going to hold back the tide of darkness to the trump of God's sound. As a people, we are more and mightier than transgenderism, than same-sex marriage, as homosexuality, as fentanyl and drugs and cocaine and alcohol. We've been sleeping and slumbering. When, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, it's reported, there's debate on whether it really happened or not. I think it did, because it sounds good. <laughs> but after those planes landed on those Japanese carriers, and those admirals were rejoicing over their great victory. There was one who was not joining in in their rejoicing. And it just wasn't any old admiral. It was Yamamoto, Admiral Yam, who had planned the attack on Pearl Harbor. It was him who recognized that the ships, when they were moored in Pearl Harbor, that it was a shallow, Pearl Harbor was very shallow, and they could not drop their bombs and their torpedoes as normal because they would go straight to the bottom. It was him who came up with the idea of putting fins on the torpedoes so that when they would hit the water, they would kick in and they would come in under the surface of the water. It was him that had devised how, what each aerial squadron would attack. This one goes after the battleships. This one goes after the cruisers. This one goes after destroyers. This one goes after the airplanes on the ground. But he didn't join in with their rejoicing. 
Because history, if it happened, and I think it did, he stood in their midst. And when they had finished with their revelry, he said, gentlemen, I fear all we've done is to awaken a sleeping giant. The devil has had his way too long. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ has been asleep too long, but this sleeping giant is about ready to get up and say, devil, enough is enough. Take your hands off of our cities. Take your hand off of our schools. Take your hand off of our children. Take your hand off of our homes. Take your hand off of Washington. Take your hand off of the dollar. Take your hand off of our oil. Take your hand and and this same church will call down the blessings of God. Oh, it's going to be some bad times. But that's when the church shines the brightest. He saw a people more and mightier. The Bible said that he placed above them taskmasters. This is a type of demon spirits. Pharaoh is a type of Satan. Egypt, a type of the world, the world system. Pharaoh, a type of Satan. Taskmasters, types of demon spirits. There is much more demonic activity in the world than you realize. Much more. Matter of fact, if your eyes, if the Holy Spirit would allow it and open your eyes to the spirit world, you would see a great conflict in the spirit world. You would see godly righteous angels, but then you would see demon spirits. We really don't know emphatically where demon spirits come from. Some try to present the idea that demon spirits are fallen angels, but that's, that's unscriptural. Angelic beings are a being of creation all of their own. And you never read in the Word of God where any angelic host can possess or occupy another human being. Never. You will never, you will not find it in the word of God. I believe that demon spirits are more than likely a part of the pre-Adamic race. Won't go into all of that because I, we get so many emails of people having heart attacks. So I'll, I'll just save you from But well, they got to come from somewhere. But these spirits, they seek to war against nations. Matter of fact, many times in you, when you leave the borders of the, of the United States and you go to some countries that, are, that lean more to the occult, you can literally feel darkness in the air. You can literally sense that there's something going on in the spirit world. I'll never forget the last time I ministered in India. Won't say the city. The Indians are some of the most brilliant people in the world. Doctors, scientists, physicists that are brilliant in math and the sciences, but yet the nation is in poverty because of demon spirits, believing in reincarnation. They believe that the cow, actually, that before I finish that statement, I, I, when I was there, I was, I was reading some 
Hindu literature doing research, trying to figure out how many gods they really worship. And really I was reading from some of their own books and it's over a million. Because in Hinduism, everything's a god. That cockroach is a god. He might be your uncle <laughs> that didn't do things right, so he came back as a cockroach or a rat or a snake. The cow is the, the highest pinnacle if you are... I don't know how they came up with this, but if you really did good in this life, you can come back as a cow. I got to tell you something, this is funny. It's true, too. It's funny, but it's true. While I was there, I, I got into a conversation with a Hindu holy man. And very respectful, I was, at, I, I was just curious. I was trying to ask to learn. And I said, you worship the cow. And, and literally, the first time I went to India in Calcutta and we stepped off the plane, there were cows walking through the airport. I mean, literally walking through the airport. That's fine. Just don't put them on the plane. <laughs> they don't do anything because it's a God. God can go where he wants to go. And so I'm asking all these questions, and I said, no, wait a minute. You worship the cow. And you know, they're starving to death, but, and there's cows everywhere. But you can't kill aunt and uncle, brother, sister, whatever. You just can't do that. And so I said, let me, let me get this straight. I said, you worship the cow. Oh, yes, it's, it's our supreme, one of our supreme beings. Okay. I said, well, answer me this question. I said, I see cows pulling wagons full of people. Oh, yeah. I said, but wait a minute. If the cow is God, shouldn't the cow be in the wagon and people pull in the wagon? <laughs> he, he said, well, he didn't say anything. He left. But I saw temples dedicated to the worship of rats. I saw temples dedicated to the worship of snakes. Several other places I've been that where the occult is demon spirits. All of these problems that we see engulfing our nation right now. There's demon spirits behind it. Spirits that are driving, seeking to destroy. But at the same time, these demon spirits, they seek to oppress the child of God. They seek to make your life hard. They seek to make everything around you difficult. What did Jesus say, John 10, 10? The thief comes not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. You know, the Bible never promises a life of ease for the child of God. The Bible never promises a primrose path. The Bible never promises that everybody's going to be a millionaire. It doesn't do that. Because the Bible is not about those things. The Bible is about salvation and developing you. But in this world, well, let me go back before I finish that statement. Peter said this, he said, brethren, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that comes against you. Paul, writing, would say, he would talk about his shipwrecks, stonings, beatings, 
He would talk about being cold, hungry, naked, in prison. He would talk about false brethren that would turn their backs on him and seek to do him harm. So Satan, through his taskmasters, seeks to make our living as a child of God as difficult as possible. The Bible said that he set out to afflict them, to heap burdens upon them. It uses, it said he made them serve with rigor. That word rigor is very interesting. It's an old English word. It's a word that's not found or used very often. And it it literally means to break into pieces. It literally means to crush. Satan wants to break you. He wants to crush you. He wants to use the desires of the flesh, strongholds that are erected in the life of a believer to weigh them down, to oppress them. And while I'm on this subject, I just want to make this statement. Don't let anybody ever tell you that Christians can be demon-possessed. They can not be. We can not be possessed. For greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. But we can be afflicted. We can be oppressed. We can find ourselves being squeezed in the moment of the crucible as that vice gets tighter and tighter. The Bible said he made their lives bitter. Placed them, the Bible said, under hard bondage, not just bondage, hard bondage. To labor in the field, to build the treasured cities. Josephus, in him commenting on this, and he said it to, to give an example of, of how the government of that day would force the labor on people. He brought out the example of the Egyptians that were forced into forced labor to build the Alexandrian canals, 150,000 forced into servitude, 20,000 died as they were slaves. Satan wants to make a slave out of the child of God. The people were hated by those in authority. And make no mistake about it, to too many in authority in this country, they hate the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This, the, 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 the hostility toward the work of God has never been greater than it is right now. And Satan had a plan. Now, Pharaoh, you got to understand something. This Pharaoh... And coming up with this evil, cruel plan, to be honest with you, I don't know if he he really didn't understand. Satan is the one that puts these thoughts into play. And he thinks in his perverted mind that I've got to get a control on population. So, I'm going to order all of the midwives of Israel to kill all the boy babies. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Whatever Satan's plans are, death is always the end result. Whereas the Lord's plans, life is always the result. Life meant nothing. And we've got those 
You know, I, it's funny. I, I read a news story just the day before yesterday in the state of Texas with, a, with the overturn of Roe v. Wade. They have instituted by legislative law heartbeat laws that you cannot abort a baby after so long, and that's good. And the writer of the article was bringing out how that the liberals were fussing because that law saved 10,000 babies so far. 10,000 babies born that would have been aborted, and they were all upset about it. Anything that doesn't care about human life is of the devil. Hello? Anything, anyone that doesn't care about human life is of the devil. Influence driven by demon spirits. And you notice how the devil... He, he changes the language to make it. No longer are they homosexuals, they're gay. Well, see, that, that title did not come out of the blue. That was a plan that began in the 1960s in San Francisco as some of the most powerful homosexual business labor leaders and other that came together with how to change the discourse. And if we can change the language, if we can take what is looked down upon and put language to it that speaks of the opposite. So they literally, and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating, it literally was a meeting they sat around for days discussing. And they decided on the word gay. That means happy, joyful. So they use that term to describe that lifestyle. Never mind that homosexual couples have the highest instance of spousal abuse, adultery among, they're not faithful, suicide. Nothing gay about it. There's nothing joyful about using your body in a way God never intended for it to be used. <laughs> then, they, then they say abortion, well, it's, it's health care. If abortion is health care, then slavery is job creation. If abortion is health care, then slavery is job creation. You see the, the jaded thinking. It's not health care. He had a plan. Now, he didn't understand the full ramification. It was Satan's attempt in the killing of the attempted killing of the young Hebrew baby boys. It was Satan's attempt to stop the coming of the Messiah. Because if all of the Hebrew boys would be, baby boys would be murdered, there could be no David. And if there was no David, there could be no David's son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan's plan is always destruction. He wants to destroy us. He wants to destroy the church. He wants to destroy the child of God. It's, 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 it, and it's interesting to note this parallels Matthew chapter 2 where Herod tried to kill all of the Hebrew boys when he heard about this babe that was born. Satan, his only goal is destruction. He, to steal, to kill, to destroy. And in this, he 
grabs two women, Shipra and Pua, women of faith. Now, I want you to understand something. I don't care how bad it gets in America. I don't care how bad the opposition comes against the church. God is going to have a voice. And I'm sorry, Baptist, God uses women. He looked down at this two and a half million, three million population of Hebrews. He didn't go to the ruling, he didn't go to the elders. He didn't go to the strong, virile men, but he reached down and he touched two women. Oh, hallelujah. And he began to move upon their hearts. And they threw aside any fear of their own life. And they said, we are not going to obey this wicked command. And as they were over all of the midwives of the Hebrews, they told every single Hebrew midwife, you do not kill those boys. No matter what happens to us, you do not kill those boys. When the devil huffs and puffs, when persecution becomes the hardest, when the church begins to be squeezed the most, that's when good things begin to happen. That's when something begins to stir on the inside of men and women. That's when something begins to move. That's when men and women say, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm sick and tired of being oppressed. I'm sick and tired of being kicked around. I'm sick and tired of this. I'm sick, and I'm not going to fall for it anymore. Now, listen, they refused to obey the king of Egypt. And instead, they bowed the knee to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Give us men and women who will not bow to Pharaoh. Give us men and women that will not bow to the cultural norm, but give us men and women that will stand up and say, we will not bend, we will not bow, we will not kneel. And even if we burn, we will not bow. They refuse. Now, here's what I'm coming to tell you. Some of you are in a bad place. You're being squeezed. Singers, musicians, make your way back. It's time to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. It's time to, let your, to stop letting your mind be the playground of the devil. It's time you got up, spiritually speaking, off of your knees. It's time you stood up and shook off those heavy bands and lifted up those holy hands. God wants to use you. God wants to make, ladies, God wants to make a Shipna and a Pua out of you. Men, he wants to make an Abraham, an Isaac, a Jacob. He wants to use you. He wants to make a Shadrach and a Meshach and a Bednego out of you. Yes, there's problems. Yes, there's oppression. Yes, there's persecution. But give us men and women that will not obey. Woo! And because of their faith, through the obedience of these women, those Hebrew women were popping babies out right and left. Here comes one, here comes another. Here comes one, here comes another. Ooh, there's two. Ooh, there's three. Here comes another, here comes another where there was what he thought was a whole lot, there was even more. Ooh, I can feel it right now. There's an army that's being born. There's an army being birthed. There's an army that's gonna come to fruition. There's a group, there's a body of Christ on this planet Earth that are sick and that will not obey Pharaoh. 
The school says you can't talk about Jesus. Yes, I can, and I will. The day's going to come. I hope I'm wrong. But some of you will go into a restaurant and bow your head to say grace over your meal, and somebody will say, I'm offended at that. Will you tell them, I'm offended, you're offended. <laughs> you keep your face and your eyes on your mashed potatoes. Leave mine alone. This table is God's table. This meal belongs to God. This chair I'm sitting in belongs to God. The car I drove up in belongs to God. The clothes on my body belong to God. The shoes on my feet belong to God. And as long as I got breath, I'm going to give glory and I'm going to give honor to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. All right, now I've got to end this. God began to move. And God blessed those two women. The Bible said God dwelt well with them. The Bible said that because of their refusal to obey an unlawful, an unjust, an unrighteous, and an hunt unholy command and they stood firm the Bible said he made them houses which means their womb became fruitful and they brought forth sons and daughters of God Ooh. First Samuel 2.30 says for them that honor me I will honor. God said, you honor me, I'll honor you. You honor me, and I'll honor you. Oh, there was persecution. Then there's going to be persecution now. There's demon spirits. There's taskmasters. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Stand to your feet this morning. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, I, yeah. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. You soldiers of the cross, we must not suffer loss. That song, give me two minutes. That song came about and was birthed on the eve of the Civil War when this country was being torn apart from the inside over the evil institution of slavery. An abolitionist was what the history calls them, primarily preachers in the North that began to use their pulpit to preach against the evils of slavery. They begin to preach and tell the people, God cannot bless us as a nation when we seek to enslave a portion of our citizens. It is ungodly, unscriptural, unbiblical. And the admonition came forth, it may cost you something, but stand up for what is right. Do you know those words? Can you sing? Just sing a little bit of it. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the world. Lift high. Lift high. Is roar your banner, it must not suffer long. from victory, from victory unto victory, his army shall he lead till every foe to
Stand up. I want you to step out. I feel led in my spirit to pray for our nation and to pray for the church. I want you to step out. I want you to come down to this front. We're going to join our faith together. Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, make your way, move up close, sing it. Stand up for Jesus, you soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner, it must not suffer From victory. In the coming days ahead, we need men and women with the spirit of Shipna and Pua that won't bow, that won't bend. And there's enough. There is enough in this nation. There's enough men and women, teenagers, that love God, that love His Word, and want to do right and want to bring glory and honor. There's more at stake than you realize. But I believe you're up to the task. I believe you're up to the task. I believe there's enough movement. I want you to lift your hands right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, as we stand here this Sunday, we recognize the sign of the times that we're living in. And we understand that the enemy, the evil one, is plying his craft in every way imaginable to stop the plan of God, the work of God, and the church and the child of God. But we are founded on a foundation, a rock that cannot be moved. This church is founded upon the cross and the blood of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And you have raised up an army of men and women that will not bend, will not bow, no matter what the evil command may be. And Lord, our nation needs a revival. Our nation needs the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Our churches need revival. Our preachers need revival. Our teachers need revival. Our singers, musicians need revival. Those who sit in the pew, they need revival. And Lord, we're asking that you would pour out your spirit. It's promised in your word. And now, Lord, we're ready to receive pour out your spirit in ways that we never thought possible and take your church and raise it up to be a glorious institution of righteousness to hold back and push back the darkness that the plan of God and the work of God may be fulfilled in the name of Jesus. Come on, sing it and pray. Stand up, Stand up for Jesus, you soldiers. Lift 